Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for the CT Smart webinar series. My name is John Patinos and I'm a project manager here at CT Smart. Uh, as is always the case, this webinar is going to be recorded and uploaded to the C2 Smart YouTube channel, along with all of our other webinars and recorded seminars. If you have any questions today, you can feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and I will uh, work with the presenter to answer them live at the end of the webinar. Today, I'm with Christoph Klauser of Kistler, C2 Smart partner and the maker of the Way in Motion sensors used in the C2 Smart urban roadway testbed project. So this project, uh, supported by USDOT and NYC DOT is one of C2 Smart's really exciting projects in which live truck loads can be monitored uh, in real time to protect infrastructure. Christoph Klauser joined uh, Kistler three point three and a half and uh, years ago and has focused on way in motion technology since the first day. He's the first point of contact with the global sales force for way in motion expertise in both large and small projects of various applications. And within Kistler, he supports the development of uh, new uh, way in motion technologies and coordinates market launch activities. So before uh, I let you get started, Christoph, I, we, Professor Nassif, Professor Hani Nassif, who um, led the Rutgers research team on the urban uh, roadway test bed, I'm going to just invite him to say a few words of introduction. Professor Nassif, are you there? We oh, just muted. Professor. Yes, thank you. I, <laughs> I was always make this mistake. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, John, thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, you know, we've been uh, working with Kistler for quite some time, and uh, due to their efforts, we've been able to uh, accomplish the uh, work that we've done on the testbed project. Uh, on the uh, uh, you know uh, BQE uh, project, uh, and uh, due to their effort, especially uh, Jess and and Christoph from uh, Kistler, we've been able to really deliver uh, a high quality uh, data on that project. And uh, so, uh, thanks for Cito Smart for hosting this seminar. Um, I attended uh, this seminar uh, to the IEEE. And it was a great opportunity for us to learn about the new technology. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, instrument uh, these sensors sometime in the future in the United States. Thanks to the effort of uh, Christoph and his uh, team, uh, they have been developing and uh, improving on the quality of these sensors and uh, you know, especially the digital quality now. So we look forward to uh, working with them closely and, and for c Smart to really be the first to uh, maybe adopt that technology. And uh, part of our theme in, in trying to implement and make our infrastructure more resilient and facilitate the movement of freight and goods and services, uh, c Smart has a dedicated theme for uh, infrastructure resilience uh, through technology and through connectivity and uh, through mobility. So uh, with, without any further ado, uh, um, you know, I'll take it back to you, John. Maybe you want to introduce the, the, our uh, today's speaker. That would, be, that would be great. But I just wanted to thank uh, all of you for uh, this opportunity to, to uh, show this work. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Nassif. Uh, Christoph, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, fine. So thank you both, um, John and Professor Hanin Nassif, for making this possible that uh, I can have this webinar today here with uh, C2 Smart and talking about Way in Motion and uh, the Kistler contribution to this BQE project. Um, so I tried to um, make this uh, webinar as interesting as possible for all of you who are somehow responsible for traffic infrastructure. And I hope that you learn quite a lot on how Way in Motion can help you there and uh, what Kistler offers then in, in particular cases for this. So um, I think, yeah, enough words for the introduction. Let's get started. And um, what you will learn in the next uh, couple of uh, minutes within the next hour. It's just an introduction of uh, the topic of way in motion at Kistler, what we did in the past, uh, where we are coming from, what company I represent actually. Um, then I would like to talk about the first approach of um, how you can use way in motion to protect your traffic infrastructure. And this is basically by knowing just the traffic loads and then adjusting your traffic infrastructure accordingly. So we look, take a look into the data collection programs in, in the US roughly and uh, look at the solution that Kistler provides for this. 
And then of course, there's, um, there is a second approach uh, for protecting the infrastructure by reducing the number of overloaded vehicles. And this is of course best done with efficient uh, weight enforcement um, measures. So I gonna do there some um, explanations on the methods that are available and used globally um, for weight enforcement and introduce the KISTER solution therefore. And um, especially looking at the BQE project where protecting bridges within New York is a crucial topic. Um, efficient bridge protection is, is a topic for many people around the world. And um, yeah, I'll also indicate here how Kistler products um, can help on, in achieving uh, these topics in bridge protection and bridge monitoring. So uh, yeah, let's jump into it. First of all, that you have a little bit an, an idea on who's the company that I'm uh, responsible or that I represent in this webinar. Um, Kistler is actually uh, located in Switzerland. We are based in Winterthur close to Zurich, but we have um, more than 60 locations. Where, um, yeah, a couple of uh, um, subsidiaries in, in the US as well. And a few of my colleagues I'll introduce to you um, as well at the end may, uh, shortly um, are based in the US. Um, we have more than 10,000 customers actually worldwide in uh, have more than 700 um, patents applied. Work, clo work closely together with a couple of universities and Rutgers and Professor Hani Nassif, one of these. And just that you get an idea about the size of the company, it's about 2,200 employees um, worldwide. So that's enough of the company introduction. Let's look at the topic of way in motion. Way in motion, just the first slide as an introduction for those of you who were not in contact with this technology until today. Way in motion is actually a technology with which you weigh each passing vehicle at any speed on the road. So you install this technology on an open road, on a highway or whatever kind of road, and you get the weight information of each wheel which is passing um, the sensors on the road. So the principle how it is actually going um, works in a way that you have sensors installed um, in the road. You see it here on this picture on the left side, there's the wheel crossing. If you look at the cross cut of the sensor here in the next image, oops, let's go back, this was not intended. Um, you see that force um, from the wheels just go through the sensor and here's the sensing element in the, sens in, in the center of the sensor. Um, and here on the sensing elements, the force is, um, is transferred to an electrical signal. It's a charge signal actually. Um, the signal looks a little bit like this one, this shape here, uh, and then the sensors are connected to, to an electronics and these electronics process the sensor signals in a way that you can um, calculate the weight of each single wheel of a vehicle. And then of course, the weights of two wheels of one axle are summed up to an axle load. Like you can see it here on this uh, picture of this example, then all axle loads are summed up to the cross vehicle weight load. Um, what we need therefore on the road is on the one hand side, the force sensors. Um, these are the Kistler linear sensors, or you, you maybe heard the name of quartz sensors. Um, that's our technology. That's what we supply to the market in more than 20 years. In addition, you need some present sensors. Normally there are um, inductive loops used. And of course the electronics, um, here is a picture of, of our data logger. There are um, other similar um, products available on the market. And why is it so important to look at way in motion and to, to look at the loads of the traffic um, that's, uh, that's actually running on, on the roads? And therefore there's a quite old um, scientific work from the Ashto. Uh, I think it's dating back in the 60s, if I remember, correctly, which is somehow referring to this uh, power of four law, which actually says that um, the load of the of a vehicle of, or of a wheel um, contributes to the damage of the of the of the road actually with the power of four. So this means actually just to visualize this um, that the one truck with uh, 30 tons, so assuming it's equally distributed just for the uh, reason of simplicity, 10 tons each axle. This would actually have the same damage to the road like 7,500 cars just to this power of four 
law which is um, which is uh, yeah um, which was found out for the road damage. So you can imagine um, now if you have one car more or less, or if one of these cars is a little bit uh, more lightweight or more heavier, it's not that significant. But if you have a lot of these trucks and maybe these trucks are even overloaded or um, exceed then the legal limits, this really has significant impact on on the lifetime of the infrastructure when you calculate the loads when you calculate remaining lifetimes, when you look at the, the damage and so on. And so this is the reason why heavy vehicles are especially, or need a special focus when, when doing the planning and the maintenance and so on of the traffic, but also for increasing the lifetime, looking at the enforcement and reducing the, the number of um, vehicles which exceed the legal um, limits. So, Another slide for the introduction is a little bit showing the worst cases, what can happen. And there were um, a couple of bridge collapses actually in the last few years. I, I just took out two um, that happened recently. One was a uh, bridge in, in Italy. It was just a small bridge crossing a, a large road um, at the bottom. And there was a one very heavy truck with 180, 108 tons, uh, which is, more than double overloaded actually. So if you have um, uh, 80 or 90,000 pounds legal weight, it it's would be still even just double the weight. And when he crossed this bridge, um, it, it fully collapsed. And there is another example from another bridge in, in Mexico where a, a heavy truck with uh, full of diesel um, caught fire in the center of the bridge and uh, heavily damaged this, this large bridge. Um, the bridge luckily did not fully collapse, but it also took um, the owners a long time to repair it and to recover. Um, so removing or getting rid of these really heavy or dangerous vehicles on, on the road, also um, in these uh, quite drastic examples shows um, that it can be important to um, yeah, avoid some of these extreme catastrophes that we can see on the pictures here. So first of all, let's get back to the two approaches that we have um, that I would like to introduce to you in this webinar. The first one um, talking about traffic data collection and actually what it helps you if you know the real traffic loads um, on your infrastructure and, and how you can do this. So looking a bit at the, the nature of traffic data collection and um, I think you well, the, the ones of you working in the DOTs, um, you're aware of uh, the traffic monitoring guide from FHWA and that you report uh, traffic data for, for several programs, uh, state programs or the federal programs. And that's always, um, well, the, the four different kinds of data are required and you either uh, um, acquire just volume data, how many vehicles are there, maybe um, in addition the occupancy, just seeing how many, yeah, how long is this the, the road actually occupied by vehicles. Um, you can do a, a classification, so not only counting, but also classify the vehicles according to um, state specific or the, the let's see, the scheme F, uh, schema from FHWA. I'm not sure why my presentation is always jumping without clicking, sorry for this. Um, yeah, so acquiring the classification data or, um, if you spend more money in, in, in more advanced census, you get uh, weight data in addition. And of course, the fourth important information is, is speed data. And all this data is reported, um, yeah, collected daily on, on many, many sites throughout the whole country, um, and then reported on monthly and annual basis, um, is state internal and to, to the FHWA. And of course, there are in the DOTs and on the federal level, um, different agencies who have different uh, purposes, what they use the, the data for. So it's basically for designing um, new roads or new bridges for planning the maintenance, the guys at the operations, just make sure that the traffic is flowing safe um, or has a good flow, make sure that um, yeah, road operation works well. It's going into some safety analysis, environmental analysis, Maybe the data is used for, for some financial planning um, or engineering economics 
or just assessing the performance of certain roads, um, seeing where do I need something new, again, getting back into the planning process and so on. So it's actually a lot of stakeholders um, that are interested in the, that in the traffic data that, that you're collecting. And um, the, the technology that you can use Therefore, it's, and I just copied this from the traffic monitoring uh, guide, the, the um, latest version that's available currently. There's actually a, a lot of different technologies that you can use just either for, for counting vehicles or counting axles, like inductive loop, magnetic sensors, microwave radars, ultrasonic sensors, and so on. Sensing um, axles with fiber optics with quad sensors provided from Kistler, for example, some infrared or laser uh, technology spending plates. Um, and uh, that's just for, for counting or getting more information on the axles, or there are other uh, technologies available for classifying, especially motorized um, vehicles, again, quartz-based sensors, fiber optic sensors, spanning plates, load cells, and so on. Um, but also for classification, uh, just based on the length of the vehicles where things like loop or magnetic or radar technology are, are is actually used so basically it's quite a wide um, or broad uh, different kinds of uh, technology available on the market there to to get there um, but the important thing to take away is that way in motion is actually the only technology um, that helps you to collect all the four important parameters um, at the same time. So the volume, the classification, the weight, and the speed information. So you need these um, Excel sensing sensors and the good ones actually that are um, that are collecting weight and, and force signals from the wheels um, to, to get the weight data and therefore um, take all the, the weight information into account for, for all the purposes that we learned about on the first slide um, for the traffic planning, maintenance planning, and so on. So uh, looking actually at why collecting weight data and weight, what makes weight data so so helpful and, and so important to acquire is, is actually these five points you, you can identify. So on the one hand side, it's actually pavement design. So um, based on um, the, let's say, this uh, latest method using the mechanistic uh, empirical pavement design guide, MEPG, um, this mandatorily requires the input of load data to well then design and, and select the right pavement for, for a new road. Looking at the more traditional Astro design um, uh, guidelines, there is this ESAL value equivalent single X load value, um, one input that you use there. So even in, in both methods already, it's important to know in the design of a pavement what traffic you can expect there. And this of course you can best uh, get from, from acquiring this data live from, from a road which is there, which is maybe comparable or um, before you do a renewal of the pavement that you um, have this data from exactly the same road. So measuring this here is definitely better than just guessing, um, guessing the weight. Pavement maintenance is, is the se second topic. Um, so you can, uh, sorry, really sorry for this. You can um, select the right measures of, of treatment during your maintenance uh, works, depending on what loads of on, on the road you, you see, and then define the intervals of what treatment you do at what intervals uh, correctly, depending on um, the weight information you have from your traffic load. So you see this is a road with a lot of traffic, I do this, this is a road with uh, only um, low weight traffic, you can apply different me uh, measures, yes. Uh, of course, in topic of planning road networks, um, by determining the cost of congestion or benefits for um, planning or calculating benefits of, of new constructions, for example, and, and strategies, um, it gives you some, some data to calculate this information. And um, as, a, as a fourth point, it's also important to mention that um, Every time you need to allocate your cost for, for new infrastructure, for maintenance works or, or something like this, um, you can 
allocate these costs fairly if you know who's responsible, who caused actually the cost. And we know, or we learned just a few minutes ago, that weight is a big contributor to the damage. So you should somehow allocate the cost of this damage also to these, these contributors of, of the damage. And this gives you then, of course, uh, more, uh, more, more opportunities if you have actually this data available. And last but not least, and there will be um, an, a separate chapter in this webinar about um, the bridge design and bridge maintenance and health monitoring of bridges, um, all within the topic of bridges and uh, bridge lifetime calculation, um, the weight and actually the load is, is uh, an important factor to take into account to get to good or let's say realistic results of remaining lifetime calculations. So um, we learned just in the last couple of minutes why way in motion is, is important and what you do can do with the data. Um, still, WIM sites are quite rare um, spread around the country. And one reason it's also given in the uh, traffic monitoring guide is it's written there, WIM sites are expensive to install and, and to maintain maybe compared to, to other technologies. So the challenge is here actually how to create good data, how to get this good data with good accuracy, how do you get this within your budget, how to reduce the maintenance cost with it or best do it without maintenance and especially for reducing costs is always having a, a long lifetime of, of the equipment you install. And the answer from Kistler on, on these um, problems and challenges is called key traffic statistics. It's a way in motion system that we especially designed for the purpose of traffic data collection for the statistics. So it is a way, way in motion system. So it really collects all four parameters of the um, of data collection. So volume, classification, speed and weight. And it meets um, the, the requirements of the ASTM standard for type one and type two. So plus minus 10 or 15%. It's not the highest accuracy that you normally use in an enforcement purpose, but for this, um, but that's actually the trade-off of getting longest lifetime reduced cost. And you you, uh, you have a certain trade-off in, in the accuracy requirements here. So the idea was really here to develop a, uh, a system and to provide a system with optimized price performance ratio and um, benefit from the quartz-based way in motion sensors, which are uh, actually maintenance free. And um, what's interesting and important to learn, um, sorry, this is again a jump in, in the slides, is um, that this design is uh, of the sensors and the system itself, it's made for um, a longest lifetime in the road. And this is achieved by in installing the sensors below the road surface, actually. You'll see it just on the next slide what this, what this actually means. Um, it's, it's quite a difference to, to how the sensors, let's say quad sensors are installed for, for the enforcement part, but therefore they gain longer lifetimes, um, sacrifice a little bit of, of accuracy and um, yeah, we can offer them at, at a, at a better, better price point. Nevertheless, it's a quad sensor with all the advantages of stability over time, stability over environmental conditions and um, covering a broad range of, of, of uh, loads um, applied to the sensor. So from very lightweight wheels to very heavy um, vehicles. And of course it comes with uh, the Kistler well-known robust electronics. So um, I was talking just about this linear compact subsurface sensor. And um, what we see on here on, on this slide is just some key characteristics on, on this way in motion systems and its subcomponents. And so um, the, the most interesting part of a way in motion system is, is of course the sensor. And um, it's, yeah, the, the, the special part of this sensor is this subsurface installation, as I mentioned. We see it here on, on this picture that there's a gap of, uh, it's a little less than one inch um, that the sensor is yeah, a little less than one inch below the road surface. So wheels are crossing on top here and the sensor is installed down there. Compared to other sensors, the, the sensor surface is directly here on the road surface. So this sensor is um, covered completely by, we call this the grout, um, this material here around the sensor. And um, 
this subsurface insulation just provides longer lifetime to the sensor because it's not exposed that much to to the environmental conditions to the wheels to the wheel loads and so on and it, it survives just longer in in the road and even if the road gets some rutting uh, after time you can uh, you're more flexible to adjust um, the rutting and to do some some grinding there um uh yeah compared to let's say the the other more uh, more accurate BIM sensors um, that are available more for the enforcement application yeah besides the sensors there's uh, of course then the electronics we call it the WIM data logger that's processing just the sensor signals for precise weight and speed measurements for um, for providing the classification data um, yeah optimized for low power consumption and of course uh, doing the vehicle classification according to the local schemes of uh, FHWA and um, also some sp uh, state specific schemes are implemented or can be implemented um, if not yet available so that's uh, that's quite easy for the um, vehicle classification. It comes with a simple web-based graphi graphical user interface, so quite easy to use. The only thing you need is a is a Ethernet connection or you, the direct connection to to the data logger, and then you open the the user interface with a standard web browser google chrome or firefox or something like that and the user interface guides you basically to uh, through all the steps for setting up the device and getting getting it up and running and of course also to retrieve the data um, but there's also multiple ways to access the data to integrate it in in traffic data management systems uh, which are of, uh, quite specific in each state in in the us but um, yeah the integration of the data in these traffic management systems is uh, normally quite straightforward and, and then simply done and uh, just to, to round up this slide to be mentioned, for the installation is also quite easy for the reason that we provide you with the pre-wired DIN rail. So that's what you see here in the picture in the, in the middle, all the components that you actually need with the stabilized power supply and so on, and the wiring it's done um, in the factory by Kistler. And the only thing you do, you actually need to do is um, install this DIN rail in, in the cabinet in the roadside, connect the sensors and, and the loops from the road to it and uh, power it up and then get it running and, and get the data. And the data is of course the the thing why you do this. So what data can you get from this? And um, here's just on one slide, a few examples on how you can evaluate the data, how things can look like um, that you do with the data. There's of course, depending on your specific needs, um, you can create specific reports or um, prepare the data, visualize the data according um, to, to the requirements you have. I give you here just four examples. Um, on the upper left side, it's just, looking at the traffic volume. So you do here, for example, three month comparison in, in three colors, I have three months and we see that uh, we look at the hourly volume between uh, 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. Then here at the end, we see by night, it's in all three months, it's very low traffic. Throughout the day, we see that in September, there was more traffic than in October and again, um, in November, less traffic than the other two months, but the pattern throughout the day um, looks very similar with the peak hours around seven and some peaks around lunchtime, and then decreasing in the evening hours again. Um, for example, if you look at how is it, how is the traffic distributed on, on Saturdays, you get an, uh, another certain pattern. Um, or if you take a look at what's the volume per vehicle weight, so you see that most of the vehicles are um, less than 3.5 tons and a few of them, but still 3.3% are above 40 tons. 40 tons is actually the legal limit in most European states, like the 80 or 90, 90 parts uh, that, that you actually have in, in the US. So you can also look at, at such uh, things or what's maybe interesting to see is as well, how much weight do I have um, uh, accumulated per day in a month uh, on, on this site on, on a specific lane. So I plotted here once a December data from, from one site uh, that I have access to with the data. And we see here uh, quite nicely shown the the pattern that uh, on the weekdays, Monday to, to Friday, we have quite high loads with all the trucks. And then on Saturday, it's significantly less on Sunday, even a little less. 
uh, like this, this repeat throughout December um, all the time. And then we see the Christmas time here. We see there's maybe a few working days where, where something is, is less going on, but then there are also the holidays where we have a different pattern in, in the way data. Um, that's all things that you can look at and yeah, basically ask your question to the data and uh, you, you have the source then for, for finding the answers to, um, to, to all your questions within, within the data. And yeah, basically that's it about the, um, the data collection part and the second approach of, um, of well, protecting infrastructure with way in motion is um, the weight enforcement. And this means you enforce and therefore hopefully also reduce the number of uh, overloaded vehicles um, over time with uh, taking way in motion systems into account. So the impact of weight enforcement, it's actually quite difficult um, to quantify. There's not much scientific data available at the moment. I start here with the graphic, which is more uh, explanation, but well, provides some, some explanations, but not real uh, quantified figures. So if you start a weigh in motion system at a, at a particular site, um, you have here in the orange display, then you have at the beginning, of course, a lot of violations. You find uh, many, many trucks which are overloaded and then um, truck drivers and truck owners, uh, freight forwarders, they learn that there is way in motion in place, that there is weight enforcement done, and then they start to accommodate to, to certain limits. And then um, normally the, the number of violating uh, vehicles or drivers, they, um, they settle at a certain level. Um, of course, you have, when you start all of this, you have quite high uh, cost and efforts uh, to, to operate all of this. Uh, but once the, the procedure and everything is somehow um, established, the processes are clear, um, everything is, is well established, also this settles to a certain level. And um, I think the, the, the interesting point then here is that with the penalties you can get and with the operating expenses you have on, on this, uh, you still get here a quite nice decent curve also with the amount you, you can get back for um, that you can use also for compensating the damage that is uh, used by or that is caused by drug drivers uh, that drive or yeah, just by overloaded trucks uh, on, on your roads. So um, actually that's that's the idea of all the weight enforcement that you get some compensation and protect um, the, the infrastructure by reducing the, the number of overloaded vehicles in total. Um, and that's something you will, for example, then see very well in when calculating remaining lifetimes for bridges or something like that. Um, so let's take a look into how you can do weight enforcement. Um, there's actually three different steps, uh, say in, from, from historic point of view, um, the first step was just doing manual weight um, enforcement. So this actually means you have a roadside control, you stop your truck, you select maybe by eye one truck which is just passing on the road. You think this looks suspicious for whatever reason, just best guess from, from the officer. You pull it somewhere to the roadside, you put it on a static scale, and then you see, oh, it was overloaded or was not overloaded. In this case, of course, you have uh, maybe not the best hit rate because maybe some people are good at guessing. Some officers have a, a quite good eye and some good experience, but um, yeah, the, the hit rate here will be will be quite limited and the number of vehicles that you can enforce with this is of course also quite limited and looking now at the BQE project and, and, and New York City where it's very difficult to, to stop a truck just next to the road and, and putting on a static scale it's yeah you don't have this infrastructure here you don't have the space on the road so it's um, this method is yeah it's difficult and has its limitations. Um, the, the semi-automatic approach um, actually uses way in motion for a pre-selection purpose. There are way in motion sites installed already just on, on, on the open road. Trucks are, are passing and officers uh, get an indication, okay, this is the weight of the truck and maybe this is overloaded or this was okay. And depending how it's actually designed, um, 
they can be uh, virtual, uh, not virtual, but variable message signs can be controlled and you can ask the truck driver now to uh, maybe go to the next parking lot or to a static weighing area, uh, go into a, a way station, for example, um, on, on US highways. So that's that's uh, it's done a little bit different in each uh, in each country. So there's quite country specific approaches. In the US, there's the virtual WIM where officers actually use data of WIM sites to um, wait for overloaded trucks and then follow them, stop them, put them on a static scale. There's way in motion used in front of the way stations to pull in the right trucks to the static scales and sort the, the correctly loaded ones and let them just bypass. Um, yeah, that's all in the way of the, the semi-automatic um, enforcement. Of course, this is a lot more efficient than just manually selecting by eye the, the violators. Um, but even here, uh, you still need to decide which truck you pull in. You put on a static scale, and once the static scale is occupied, there's maybe 10 other overloaded trucks passing by that you cannot control. And um, you have, at least with the selection, um, you have a good hit rate, but um, the risk for one driver of an overloaded truck is still quite low to be caught and, and um, prosecuted based on, on uh, this approach with the virtual VIM and pre-selection. So the most advanced um, method is the direct weight enforcement. You really only have a, a WIM system installed on your road. You have a, a camera for vehicle identification and license plate reading um, installed and connected to it. That's actually all the data that you use. Um, once the WIM system detects, oh yeah, this is an, an overloaded truck and it's identified with the, with the camera, um, it's already processed in a back office and the fine um, is, is sent to, to, to the truck owner or through the truck driver and um, everything is done automatically. So this means each single truck on, on the road is checked, each single violator uh, can be can be identified and can be fined, and um, there's normally some measures in, included that if the rim system provides some some errors or warnings, it detects some irregularities, that you uh, discard maybe the the measurement and you don't enforce it. Um, but basically, if you get quotes of enforcing 60 or 70, 80 percent of of already all overloaded vehicles, um, it's already let's say a big risk for, for the violators to drive an overloaded truck. And this will cause significantly reduction in, in overloaded trucks on, on the infrastructure. So looking from left to right, um, the measures just prove, uh, provide more and more efficiency in, in the weight enforcement. And um, yeah, and actually it's uh, the, the direct weight enforcement. That's something yeah, we are looking into with the BQE project and then Professor Hani Nassif. And it's also, yeah, it's done in a couple of states in, in Europe, Czech Republic, Russia, Hungary, and so on. And I think there are more and more to come and go into this direction. So that's actually where we see the trend and where we expect the future of weight enforcement and weight motion to be. Um, that's actually what I, I just um, explained on the previous slide. So in the weight enforcement today, this pre-selection approach is, is mainly done on most countries. You at least don't stop the incorrectly loaded vehicles, but um, and you can pull out of service the, the even dangerous trucks, but you only uh, check a few one. Whereas with the direct enforcement, um, you do a 24 seven uh, weight enforcement and you control really each passing vehicle and um, yeah, use the data already for, for the enforcement purpose. But there's of course a, a big but that you need to mention with talking about direct enforcement. So the national legislation needs to be in place that you can use way in motion data already for the enforcement and this normally requires uh, a process with legislation to provide certain certification and, and, and laws and so on, that it's possible to use this way in motion data um, for, for enforcement purposes. So besides providing good technology for way in motion, what KISTL actually strived for, um, it's important that um, national legislation bodies also um, put in their efforts in, in uh, making and enabling this technology. And that's the point where Kistler can a little bit support with know-how and expertise from other countries, but where of course the, um, the big part of the work needs to be done um, in, in, uh, in, the, well, in the governments of, of each country. 
So um, looking at what Kislo can provide for, for weight enforcement, there's actually, um, well, we call it a full solution where we can provide you with uh, the sensors for installing in the road to measure the weight, the classification, and we can even uh, provide information on tire anomalies, so detecting flat tires or mismatching tires, uh, wrong direction. Um, we can enhance this system with license plate, uh, reading cameras and photo documentation. If required, we can also enhance it by measuring the dimensions of the vehicles, um, all the local processing of this data and matching of this data for each vehicle, um, uh, give an indication if a vehicle, for example, for pre-selection purpose should go to the, to, the, to the next parking area, to the next setting scale. Um, and there is a back office software available for further processing violations, which is of course then quite, spe uh, quite uh, specific to national laws of, of the um, weight enforcement process. Yes, so that's, that's what we call actually a full enforcement solution and which is normally then tailored to specific needs um, in, in the country and, and processes and so on. Um, yeah. When talking about way in motion, and that's what Professor um, Hani Nassif just mentioned at the introduction, um, there is that with weight enforcement, we see that the big trend and the, where the big um, the the big changes with way in motion is, is is happening within the next years, and we now provide for this a, a new WIM system, which is especially designed also for this weight enforcement application, um, and where we want to bring, well, where, which where we want to overcome somehow the the limitations why way in motion is today only used rarely in in direct weight enforcement and make WIM way in motion yeah better usable for for this direct weight enforcement application so what's new about this key traffic digital and why do we call this somehow a, a revolution or really a, the next generation of, of weight enforcement and here i need to step back a little bit and, and go into deeper details of, of technology um, i do a brief excursion there um, you see on the left side of this slide, uh, just a cross cut of a, of a way motion sensor, and that is our latest one, this Linear Digital. And you see inside the WIM sensor, there are these blue quartz disks, or they are actually not blue, but here indicated in, in blue on this um, graphics. And these quartz disks provide actually the force signals, which are the basis for the calculation of the, of the weight. And in, let's say, the technology which is available until today, there's just one sum of all signals used, and then there's one signal uh, from a linear sensor provided for processing and weight calculation. The new difference with the digital sensor is that we now read out this, the signal of each single quartz. So in existing technology, all quartzes were summed up, and now we look at the, the signal of each quartz. If you look at raw signals, this actually um, looks like this. Of course, as an end user, you don't have to worry for um, or care for, for the raw signals. But I think this, this picture makes this quite um, well visible what information we, we get out of um, this sensor. So really, um, each line, if you look here in this, in this would be the, the time direction. Um, and this is actually a vehicle with four axles. So the first axle here, this is a single tire on the first axle. Then it's the second axle, which is a little heavier than the third and the fourth axle. Um, both or all the three, the second, third, and fourth axle have dual tires on, on both sides. And even if one of these tires would be flat, we would see this in, in the shape of the signal. Um, and so, Based on these signals, we, we can do all our calculations based on axle spacing, on, on tire types, on the weight, of course, on the lateral position. So if, it's, if the, the truck is driving a bit more on the left, on the right side, and this is all a lot more information that was available from the existing sensors, which are used um, until today. And with this much more information we get from each single wheel, which is crossing the sensor, this helps us to bring really rim to the next level of, of accuracy and, and some additional um, information that, that we can provide with the system. So that's really a, a breakthrough and a, a great thing for us from a technology point of view, um, but also with regards to accuracy and the application of direct weight enforcement um, helps to bring things to the next level. Um, 
yeah, looking a bit at the benefits that um, come with with weight motion here, and I think I need to speed up a, a bit looking at the time. Um, we get two percent or up to two percent accuracy, which is somehow um, but really at the edge of what, what's possible uh, with with way in motion. Of course, we need good road conditions, but that's um, feasible by getting yeah and calibrating each single quartz inside this sensor. And therefore, somehow we, we are able to build really a perfect uh, WIM sensor, which does not have any contribution to the weighing error at all. Um, and therefore reducing then or improving the, the overall performance. We are more flexible with, with driving maneuvers. So when we had vehicles changing the lanes, for example, this was difficult for existing technology and will be, um, can be handled better with, with the new technology. So even if wheels touching two sensors, which are adjacent, just mounted next together, um, yeah, we get decent signals. So yeah, we are more reliable in, in free flow and in open road traffic with this system. Um, if we look at roads and everyone really needs to understand that the roads and the property of the road have, an, have a big impact on the way in motion accuracy. You can have the best sensor, but if the road in which you install the sensor is, is crap, you will not get really good uh, results from this. With the key traffic digital and the digitization of each single quartz signal, we have some measures um, that we, at least to a certain extent, can compensate for some road influences. We cannot make a crap road really good again, but we have some chances to, to um, improve um, the performance on roads which, which are less than perfect. And um, in addition, what you've seen at the image of the raw signals at the beginning, we also get the information on on tire types, so single dual white base tires, um, or if there's, a, if there's a flat tire implemented. And um, for those of you who are a little bit more um, into way in motion systems and know how they actually work, um, it's also important to mention that you don't need to install any inductive loops anymore with this digital sensors. So for the vehicle presence detection, if you remember the very first slide of the introduction of way in motion, we, we required with existing technology to install um, inductive loops to, to detect the presence of the vehicle, to um, add all the wheel loads and X loads correctly to one cross vehicle weight. And um, with the digital sensor now, with Key Traffic Digital, we have magnetic field sensors implemented in exactly the WIM sensor. So there's no additional loops required anymore for detecting the presence. So th this means you install less sensors in the road, you have less damage to the road, you have less, less efforts during installation, and of course, less equipment to install and maintain in, in the cabinet. And last but not least, um, the linear digital sensors, they are connected in this key traffic digital system to industrial grade uh, standard electronics, which are absolutely robust, have large temperature range, um, are absolutely proven for long term um, usage in under uh, harsh conditions. So uh, you have got reliable electronics in, 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 the, in the cabinet and therefore should get trouble free and reliable equipment on the road and in the cabinet for permanent data acquisition without any interruptions. And, so, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to leave a few more minutes for, for question. I don't know how much more you have, but I can just start. Yeah, to... I have uh, just very few slides giving um, an idea on, on the bridge protection. It's, I think, three slides left. And I just jump in quickly on, on this bridge protection topic. Um, bridge protection, actually, or bridge damage, you might know the, the civil engineers among you, it's, it's mainly caused either by fatigue or corrosion. And for fatigue, it's important to know that uh, you have the, the, the traffic loads um, and all the loads on your bridge that you can do the calculations. And for corrosion, of course, there are some countermeasures which are independent of, of way in motion. So knowing the, knowing the loads for the fatigue calculations is a, is a crucial part to, um, to prevent these bridge failures. And what I want to explain is that Kistler actually has um, three different ways that it can offer for, for protecting bridges. On the one hand side, just um, 
capturing the traffic loads with the key traffic statistics system, for example, that you know what loads you have on the bridge and can do correct calculations. Or you can, um, with the key traffic plus system, identify and detour the heavy traffic vehicle. And uh, last but not least, also there are some sensors available for Kistler for, for um, structural health monitoring. But this is a separate topic. I don't want to focus here in detail. Um, looking at how the traffic load data is actually used with the bridge monitoring, it's um, normally in line with this national, this is for example, a national bridge inspection standard or other national standards are similar where you have to do periodical inspect ins inspections and calculations. You do the fatigue calculations and therefore you should normally take into account the real traffic loads to get in the end also the real remaining lifetime of the road. Whereas many just take into account some model data or some standard data from the standards, but then of course they get certain results which do not correspond to the real situation in, uh, that the bridge actually has. And if this is just too conservative, then your remaining lifetime is too short and shorter than it actually needs to be. Or if, it not, if it's not conservative enough, you may have even a failing bridge um, also uh, and that you could have detected if you would have known the, the real loads. And um, therefore, again, I would like to point out that this key traffic statistics system is our solution for doing really cost efficient weight um, or traffic load capturing um, on, on the bridges. And last but not least, let me just yeah, jump over this a uh, bit briefly and that we have just some time for, for questions. And when we were talking about bridges, I would like to, to let you know as a closing part of the webinar that these two bridges that actually failed and I introduced at the beginning here in Italy, um, there was a new bridge built and this bridge actually received a, a way in motion system with Kistler and ANPR cameras that they now see and detect um, the overloaded trucks and now they, they contact all the owners of the overloaded truck and, and make them aware of the weight limits that are actually there. Also, there's not yet a direct enforcement uh, available in, in Italy. They, they have such a system for contacting these, um, these owners of overloaded truck. And in Mexico, there's a way in motion system installed way before the bridge um, where they can detour then the overloaded trucks. If there's an overloaded truck detected, they put them on another route and uh, they are not allowed to cross the bridge anymore. And they also use Kislow in motion technology for this. So um, yeah, let's just take a couple of minutes for, for, for the questions. I'm sorry for um, somehow exceeding a bit of the time. I hope this was interesting for you. And uh, John, I hope that you received a couple of interesting questions that we can also take now in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, so uh, if you, if you uh have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of the Zoom screen here. I, I will deliver a, just a quick question to kick things off. First off, I was wondering if you and Professor Nassif, maybe you can jump in if you'd like to can just provide a bit of more overview of what you worked on together and what you're working on together right now and maybe why you're excited about it. Um, yeah, yes, I can start with this and um, maybe Professor Nassif can then provide more of, of the, the background of this. Um, I was actually involved in, in, in installing one first pilot site for um, acquiring WIM data in New York City with the idea of protecting there the, the sensitive bridges from the overloaded truck as you because you know there in New York there are many of these overloaded trucks and they are really a threat to the bridges there and the only measure to increase the lifetime of the bridges and, and to, to do the maintenance all of things there is really to reduce this traffic and we have now a first site installed where we get good data from um, within this BQE project we are talking about a second site and with, with the overall goal to establish an efficient enforcement solution within New York City to really reduce the number of overloaded truck. And it's really a great process to, to be there, part of this from the beginning and hopefully one day also being part of, of uh, the implementation of this system up and running. Yeah, that, that's exactly, uh, you know, the involvement of Kistler was very, very essential for the success of the pilot study. Uh, especially we are uh, trying to achieve a target accuracy and without using the Kistler sensor, we would not have been able to do that. In fact, we put the Kistler sensor in the same location, in the same lane as the other type of sensor, the piezo 
uh, electric uh, you know, sensor and the accuracy was by far uh, uh, much better. So if we are, and, and, and as you know, for, I mean, there's a question also about the legislation. As you know, this background work that we have done in BQE, uh, um, you know, because myself and Dr. Azbe were uh, involved in the BQE panel. And one of our recommendation was to put up a legislation for automated enforcement. And I think to give them credit, the New York City DOT and the representatives from the area uh, have worked very hard on, on developing a legislation which is now under discussion in the Senate in, in New York uh, state to basically designate that site, uh, the BQE site as a uh, you know, uh, automated enforcement site uh, with a certain accuracy that we believe after we did also recent calibration for after a year that the sensors from Kistler will, will definitely achieve that. And hopefully that will facilitate if that legislation is passed. I think Kistler and other uh, vendors will really benefit from that because this is the role of CETO Smart. We're trying to introduce technology to facilitate the movements of goods and services uh, to the area. However, we also we have to be uh, cognizant that our infrastructure is, is old and we need to make it more resilient and this is the best way, the, the more you know, ubiquitous way of, of making enforcement uh, fair and, and uh, distributed over the whole network. So I think Kistler's role in, in our project was very prominent in the sense that they gave us the technical support on how to do the, uh, uh, you know, improve the uh, calibration, improve the accuracy of these sensors, given that we have not been able to do a, um, a repaving of the pavement. So I want to thank Kistler. I want to thank CETO Smart for uh, their contribution. I tried to answer some of the questions online. Uh, there's another question. Uh, what is the total life cycle of WIM and total budget for four roll rain? Maybe, uh, Chris, maybe you want to address that, Christoph? Um, yes. So with regards to the life cycle, it mainly depends actually on, on the road, on the pavement. The, the standard answer to this question is um, normally when you do a repaving, you also replace the, the rim sensors in, in your road. Um, maybe the answer is not fully satisfying here. Um, let's say we have on the one hand side, on the let's say the worst case, we have Nordic countries where they have spikes and, and studded tires, um, which are then a big damage or a big, uh, well, that yeah, provide quite large damage to the pavement, but also then to the sensors in the pavement where they replace rim sensors every two years. And on the other extreme, we have sites where sensors are installed for, for more than 10 years. And there's really quite, uh, quite a lot of um, sites available as references where sensors installed for, for 10 years or even more. Mm -hmm and still working very well. So in the end, it, it depends a bit on, on, on the infrastructure you have in, but the, the standard answer is about five to eight years and depending a bit on, on the pavement. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, okay. uh, the minimum layout uh, can, can, the question is, I mean, wind system could work with one linear sensor per lane. If so, what is the accuracy? Can we have all the functionality? So, yeah. Um, it's actually possible to only have one WIM sensor per lane. Um, in this case, you would need to install two loops and, and one WIM sensor. In this case, you would only measure then one side of the vehicle. So for example, you install the WIM sensor on the right side of the lane, you measure all right vehicles, uh, all right wheels of the vehicle, and then you would just double it. You would assume that the weight distribution from left to right is 50-50, and then you double the right side to the left. How much error you actually provide then in, into the, the gross weight is then depending on, on how correct this assumption of 50-50 um, weight distribution is, what we see from, from our data. And um, you've, we've maybe also seen then at the BQE pilot side, there can be sometimes it's only, it's already 5% difference between left and right. And then we already have this 5% difference. If, the, if there's more imbalance, then there's of course more error. Um, we say our performance we can get with um, if we measure each wheel on the left side and each wheel on the right side once, then we are in the order of magnitude of 10 to 15% to error. But then with doubling this uh, or with, with the assumption of, of the imbalance, um, this is definitely worse than, than the 10 to 15% that we can achieve with installing two WIM sensors um, on one lane. Um, 
Crystal, there's another question on uh, the countries that have been using the direct enforcement. And the question is what standards uh, are used and how can your company help in other parts of the world? So um, actually all countries who do direct weight enforcement define their own le legislation. They are looking at the OIML um, R134. They are lo looking maybe at, at the cost standard, um, but they wrote their own legislation for weigh in motion with their own requirements on, on, on the certification and on their, their own procedures. Um, yeah. As Kistler, we are, we are somehow, well, we, we supplied sensors or we have certified systems in, in some of these countries. So we are quite close to the customers in, in these countries. Um, and we helped Dr. Uh, Professor Nassif already in, in New York as well a little bit with the legislation from, from other countries giving examples how they did it, uh, looking at, at the, the, the laws there or providing or enabling um, contacts maybe from officials from one country to another. So that's something that, where we can offer our, our network and, and expertise on, on these topics. Yeah, let me follow up on that, Christoph. I think this is a, a very important point. And the fact that, uh, as you said, each country uh, has to develop their own uh, targets and, and the legislation. There are about four different uh, standards. Uh, we worked with Kistler. We, we, we're trying to develop our own combination but um, you know, ASTM is is and, and NIST are the two uh, governing uh, you know standards in this country. We also look at the uh, you know cost, the European standards, and also the international standards. And it, and then all countries have used a combination of all uh, I would say of, of of the different standards. And uh, at the end of the day, like Christoph said. The legislation has to reflect what can be achieved in each country and what are the, uh, uh, you know, um, the jurisdiction. What do they? How do they want to enforce it? And to what level? So uh, there is currently a legislation, thanks to the New York City DOT and their uh, engineers and lawyers. We uh, they worked on a legislation. It's under now consideration in New York State, uh, but is designated only for the site where the uh, New York City DOT project is ongoing with CETO Smart. But hopefully if that legislation uh, uh, would pass, I think that would be the first uh, official site, hopefully in, in, in the United States, and that will open up the legislation for other uh, states and other locations. Uh, any other questions? Uh, <laughs> I think we answered most of them. Uh, there are a couple of them, uh, but. Uh, Christoph, I want to thank you again for this. I don't know if there's any other questions, uh, John, that I did not pick up. I think uh, we've hit all the questions. If you want to try to sneak in a question in the last minute here while I'm, I'm wrapping up, you can feel free to do so. Uh, I just before, uh, before we wrap up, just a quick note. If you enjoyed this webinar, definitely follow C2Smart on Twitter. Join the C2Smart LinkedIn group and our mailing list. Our next webinar is going to be on November 24th on edge computing for safer and smarter transportation applications with Professor Yinhai Wang, Director of Pack Trends at University of Washington. Looks like there's no more questions. So I want to uh, just again, extend my thanks to uh, Christoph Klauser at Kistler for speaking with us today. Thank you, Christoph. And thank you, Professor Nassif for your remarks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure being here and it was great talking to you. And yeah, looking forward to the collaboration with the C2Smart, BQE, Professor Honeyvent, the whole team. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll be staying in touch.